Hello everyone and welcome to another reading of the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy. This time we deal with chapter 18, The Stimulating Effects of Tea. And, well, like I said already in the introduction of chapter 17, it gets more and more interesting with every chapter. This is quite a long one, so probably longer than 45 minutes, but this had to be read really in one time through. And the most interesting thing is that you will see the connection between uh, the last broadcast that we did. Um, especially I want to advise you to take a look at the video we made on Hour of the Truth, Special XXL, The Global Vatican, where we read the first chapter of the book The Global Vatican that Tom Fress is reading for the moment on Inquisition Update. And also take a look at the last shows that we did on Hour of the Truth that were dealing with the Carroll family, because here we go much deeper into that subject than we've done before in Rulers of Evil. And um, it will really, I mean, it was for me, it was really enjoyable, so I hope you enjoy it the same way. But let's start reading The Stimulating Effects of Tea. The East India Company was a major subsidizer of the Jesuit mission to Beijing. The Jesuits, in turn, interceded with Oriental monarchs to secure lucrative commercial favors for the company, including monopolies on tea, spices, saltpeter, that is used for explosives, silks, and the world's opium trade. Indeed, according to Reed's Commerce and Conquest, the story of the Honorable East India Company, the company appears to owe its very existence to the Society of Jesus. How this came to be is worth a discretion. Read on. Briefly, in 1583, four young commercial travellers, Fitch, Newberry, Leeds and Storey, set out from London with letters of introduction from Queen Elizabeth to the Emperor of China. Somewhere east of the Persian Gulf, they were arrested by the Portuguese for illegally uh, crossing the quote-unquote line of demarcation. Pope Alessandro VI, whose mistress, as we recall, was Julia Farnese, Paul III's beautiful sister, had drawn the line in 1493 from the North Pole through the Azores to the South Pole. All land west of the line was granted to Spain and those east were granted to Portugal. The four violators were sent in chains to the Portuguese colony of Goa, on the western coast of India. In Goa they were rescued by a fellow countryman, Thomas Stevens. Stevens had influence. He was rector of the University of Goa and he was a Jesuit priest. Father Stevens arranged their release, but apparently not without certain conditions. <laughs> of course, there are always conditions when a Jesuit does something for a non-Jesuit. Huh? Story joined the Society of Jesus. Newbury and Leeds accepted posts in the Goan colonial government. Ralph Fitch, on the other hand, proceeded on to China, evidently under an Ignatian oath, otherwise the Portuguese viceroy would not have permitted him to carry on. In 1591, Fitch returned to England and, like Marco Polo before him, tantalized adventures with the lucrative possibilities of transporting to the Western Hemisphere all the Oriental splendors he'd seen. Eight years later, on September 24, 1599, with a subscription of a little more than 30 pounds, Fitch and several others formed the East India Company. Oh, you see, in that time it didn't take much money to find a company like that. <laughs> Compare that to today. But that's 30 pounds that we hear of officially, of course. We do not hear of all the Jesuit injected money afterwards. And now, in 1773, the East India Company was governed by Freemasons, whose grandmaster since 1772 was the ninth Lord Peter. His mastery would continue until 1777. Related to the Stortons, Norfolks and Arundels, the Peter family was highly esteemed by the Society of Jesus. It was the Peters who, back in the 16th century, bankrolled the original Jesuit missions to England. The East India Company most 
oh sorry, the East India Company's most powerful political attaché was Robert Petty, Lord Shelburne. We recall Shelburne as quote unquote the Jesuit of Berkeley Square, who worked in 1763 with Lord Bute, you remember him from chapter 17 I think? to conclude the French and Indian wars with the Treaty of Paris, which isolated England from European alliances and angered Americans over the Western lands. Acting on East India Company's behalf, Shelburne colluded with the King's friends on a scheme designed to disturb the relative peace which had existed between American merchants and England since the repeal of the Townshand Act in 1770. It went like this. Stored in the company's dockside, <coughs> excuse me, stored in the company's dockside, British warehouses were 17 million pounds of surplus tea. This tea could not be released for sale until a duty of one shilling per pound was paid to the crown. If the king would exempt the company from paying the shilling duty, the company would sell the tea through special consignees to Americans at prices lower than the colonists were paying for either the duties, the duty at English tea or even the smuggled Dutch tea. Everyone would win. The American tea drinkers, still suffering from the depressive effects of British banking crisis of July 1772, would win. East India Company would win. And with a windfall duty of not one but three shillings a pound, the crown would win. The only loser would be the colonial tea merchants, who had been enjoying nice profits on both dutied and smuggled tea. The king's friends directed Parliament to put the scheme into law, and on May 10, 1773, the quote-unquote Tea Act went into effect. Predictably, the tea merchants reacted in fury. Over the next six months, they pressed the intercolonial network of dissident propagandists to help them mount a protest. What began as an injustice against tea merchants was amplified to the, by the propagandists into a widely felt injustice against the colonies generally. Then, on July 21, 1773, Ganganelli, Pope Clement XIV, abolished the Jesuits, quote-unquote, for all eternity. His brief of disestablishment uh, is entitled Dominus ac Redemptor Noster, which is usually translated, quote-unquote, God and our Redeemer. We should note that Redemptor also means revenue agent. Considering that the brief's real effect in the long term was a dramatic increase in paper revenues from a new Fribonian America, perhaps God and, God and our revenue agent would be more appropriate translation, if not the intended one. Although Catholic history calls the disestablishment quote-unquote a supreme tragedy, John Carroll more accurately appraised it as the secularization of the Society of Jesus. Thousands of Jesuits now rose to secular prominence throughout the Western world, in the arts, sciences and government. Raimondo Chimenez became a radical Freemason. Alessandro Zorzi from Venice joined the editors of the Italian Encyclopedia. Dr. Boscovich arrived in Paris, where his scientific reputation secured him the post of Director of Optics of the French Navy. Esteban Ortega became a music critic and published a book in Paris entitled The Revolution in the Italian Musical Theatre. We've already seen how Professor Joseph Ignace Guillotine of the Bordeaux College became the physician who gave France the beheading machine named after him. Adam Weishaupt, dismissed from the Jesuit College at Ingolstadt, attracted the fiercer elements of European Rosicrucian Freemasonry into a new secret cult in Bavaria, his Illuminati, whose cover was eventually blown in order to convince public opinion that evil secret societies were being diligently unmasked when in fact they were not. This was another instance of blown cover as cover, as we have learned already in a previous chapter reading this book. 
you know that's what they do they make you think that oh this is exposed to the outside world this is no secret society anymore everybody knows about that and then they just keep on doing their thing they blow this cover to cover something else up this is exactly how the illuminati, illuminati was formed i told that over and over again in the broadcast that they were just made up in the time to be another front organization for the jesuits who were suppressed at that time and by then of course blowing up the cover of the illuminati so called everybody thought now it is completely done now we have no secret societies ruling about us anymore but you will see how wrong you are when you think that when i continue reading in this wonderful chapter countless other members of the greatest clandestine intelligence agency the world has ever known now secularized with the jeering approval of its enemies crossed the atlantic to help guide americans through the pains of becoming the first nation expressly designed to be a febronian bellarminian democratic democratic republican church state what an amazing production all the more impressive for the complete invisibility of its means We've seen how the brief of this establishment was served upon Lorenzo Ricci in mid-August, and how the general was removed to the English college a few blocks away, where he remained for five weeks until late September. Interestingly, the dean of the English college at that time was a 32-year-old Jesuit professor of controversial theology named John Mattingly. Mattingly was an American, said to be the lone American Jesuit in Rome. He was a native of Maryland, a graduate of St. Omer's, where have you heard that before, and a dear friend of John Carroll, who, as we know, had departed Rome five months before Ritchie's arrest. Within 15 years, Carroll would invite Mattingly to become the first president of Georgetown University, and offer Mattingly would decline. What might Lorenzo Ricci be like? Uh, what might Lorenzo Ricci be likely to discuss for five weeks? A. Under a British roof. B. In the custody of a young American Jesuit. C. At a time when the American merchants were incensed at being cheated out of their tea profits by a new law. D sponsored by British Freemasons, and E, whose grandmaster happened to be Ritchie's secret servant. Might the general have been conferring with members of the British East India Company, one of the English college's major patrons? Might their discussions have involved to which American ports their tea might be most advantageously shipped, and when? Apparently so. For while Ritchie was residing at the English College, Parliament authorized the East India Company to ship half a million pounds of tea to Boston, New York, Philadelphia and Charleston, consigned to a group of specially chosen merchants. Might Ritchie have been formulating with Carroll's friend Mattingly plans for demonstration intended to climax the agitations that had been fomented in the colony since the beginning of his generalate in 1758? Might he have suggested a spectacular event to occur in, say, Best Boston Harbor, symbolizing the colonists' frustrations with England? And might not Parliament respond to this event with vengeful measures designed to push the colonists over the brink of rebellion? Aren't five weeks sufficient time to script such a quote-unquote Boston Tea Party, along with the harsh legal measures with which it might be punished? As well as how the colonists' violent reaction to the punishment might be coordinated? Outcome suggests that Ritchie did more in his five weeks at the English College than languish in custody. We have seen how the general was taken from the English college to Castel Sant'Angelo, with its secret tunnel to the papal apartments in the Vatican. 
for many months after his imprisonment, Lorenzo Ricci was quote unquote questioned by the Inquisition, according to traditional church history. But the Inquisition had been administered by Jesuits since 1542. Not surprisingly, the Inquisitors pried absolutely no useful information out of Lorenzo Ricci. In October 1773, Austrian officials with drawn bayonets descended upon the Jesuit college in Bruges. The officials were Austrian because Bruges was under the jurisdiction of the Austrian government. They arrested John Carroll and the rest of the college faculty and students. Stripped of his possessions and papers, Carroll was spared further humiliation by the timely intercession of his erstwhile travelling companion Charles Philip Sturton's cousin, Henry Howard, Lord Arundel of Wiltshire. The Catholic nobleman escorted Carroll across the English Channel to Wiltshire's lushly rolling hills. On his family estate near Tisbury, Howard had been constructing a Palladian mansion, New Wardour Castle. One of Carroll's duties was to write his version of the closing of the Bluish College in order to help Henry Howard and other English sponsors of the college win damages from the Austrian government. His principal core, how, chore, however, was to administer the chapel occupying New Wardour's Castle West Wing. In this way, Carroll established a connection with Henry Howard's art agent in Rome, a Jesuit named Francis Thorpe. Now it gets really interesting. Thorpe was a renowned intelligence broker, a man whose knowledge of Rome, its happenings and resources was legendary. His apartment was a favorite meeting place for visiting English nobility and his favorite English nobleman was Henry Howard. Howard had put Father Thorpe in charge of quote, every detail, every aspect of the chapel's design, unquote. Father Thorpe and John Carroll needed no introduction to one another. From the editor's notes to Carroll's letters we learn that Thorpe taught at St. Omer's during the years John was a student there. Moreover, he was Carroll's favorite instructor. These remarkable facts suggest interesting probabilities. From Tisbury, in less than a day, Carroll could reach Benjamin Franklin's residence in London by stagecoach. Franklin, for his scientific achievements and enlightened egalitarianism, had long been the toast of Europe, a darling of Jesuit intellectuals. He was the exclusive colonial agent now, representing the commercial interests of all 13 colonies before the crown. Franklin knew more about America than anyone else living in England and more about England than any other American. Francis Thorpe knew more about England than anyone else living in Rome, and more about Rome than any other Englishman. And both men knew John Carroll well. And there Carroll was, for the six months during which time the Tea Act erupted into the most explosive scandal of the revolutionary epoch, poised in Tisbury to facilitate information between these two personal friends of his, geniuses, institutions. But where is the evidence that anything bearing on the American Revolution transpired between Ritchie and Thorpe and Carroll and Franklin and Howard and the entire Anglo-American Masonic system? We are left with nothing but clues and outcome, which nonetheless emphatically point to a fruitful collaboration. During the night of December 16, 1773, a gang of Indians climbed aboard certain ships in Boston Harbor, ripped open 342 of the East India Company's tea chests and threw overboard their contents, valued at $90,000. Well, they looked like Indians, and witnesses thought they were Indians, but the big open secret was that they were Freemasons in disguise. Perhaps the most succ succinct 
statement on the subject appears in respected Masonic historian Arthur Edward Waite's New Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. From here we quote, The Boston Tea Party was entirely Masonic, carried out by members of the St. John's Lodge during an adjourned meeting. Unquote. And we all know what St. John stands for in the Roman Catholic Church. I help you if you don't get it. It's Lucifer. John the Baptist. They see them as Lucifer. Parliament reacted to the Boston Tea Party in a way calculated to increase dozens of rolling boulders into a devastating landslide. Without seriously inquiring into who was responsible and wholly disregarded the offer of more than a hundred Boston merchants to make restitution, Parliament rushed into law a mess of unreasonable punitive legislation, closing the port of Boston to trade, forbidding town meetings without the consent of the governor, denying the Massachusetts legislature the right to choose the governor's council, providing for the quartering of British and Hessian troops in the colony, and ordering that any officer or soldier of the crown accused of an act of violence in the performance of his duty should be sent to another colony or to England for what would surely be a sweetheart trial. Now we just read that uh, providing for the quartering of British and Hessian troops. The Hessian troops, I remind you, we will learn more about them, or we learned already about them, when I told you about the role of the Rothschilds at the time. That the Hessian prince was very, very rich, and that his soldiery was sold to anybody who could afford them, and that the Rothschilds made a fortune by that in that time. The author says, to complete the overkill, Parliament passed the Quebec Act, which could cut off the claims of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Virginia and New York to their western lands, and place these lands, to add insult to injury, under the French Catholic jurisdiction of Quebec. And in the broadcast that I've told you to look in the begin, look into that also, because we are speaking about the Quebec Act. So exaggerately out of proportion to the offense they were famed, framed to punish these notorious quote-unquote intolerable acts caused every class of American to sympathize with the Tea Partiers. So every American sympathized with the Freemasons. Isn't that a good thing? Suddenly independence was no longer a radical alternative. The intolerables rendered independence the subject of sensible, serious conversation as never before. Governor Hutchinson was recalled to England and was replaced by General Thomas Gage, who brought an army of 4,000 men to quarter in Boston. Gage vowed severe discipline. The colonists vowed severe resistance. Quote, the die is cast, unquote. George III wrote to Lord North, Lord North, the colonies must either triumph or submit. Now John Carroll left Wardour Castle in May 1774 and sailed for Maryland to reunite with his aged and widowed mother, the former Eleanor Darnall, whom he had not seen in 25 years. The history of Eleanor Darnall is, is the history of Maryland, which bears some reflection here. So now Tapper Saucy goes a little bit more into the history of um, uh, the mother of Carol, who was over, uh, living over there in Maryland. And for that I can tell you already right now, uh, also with the coming sentences I'm going to read, Go to our Hour of the Truth special XXL, the Global Vatican, and listen to that, where a Roman Catholic, a Knight of Malta, a former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See between 2005 and 2008, Francis Roney, wrote a, wrote a book from a Catholic point of view, of course, 
which is interpreted by Tom Fress's reading of the book, an Inquisition update, by a Protestant. And when you read that in combination with this book, and of course other things like the broadcast I told you, you will get a complete picture of how the Roman Catholic Church, and especially the Jesuits, were behind the forming of the government of the United States in 1776, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. That, were, or that was their work. And the more you dig into this history and learn it for yourself, the more you will understand. And just to make sure, I don't blame the American citizens, the normal American people, but it is the government that has been taken over and that was made from the beginning to be a universal, a Roman Catholic government. And the more you study this kind of history, the more you see that, and the less you will wonder about everything that is going on today in 2015, especially after the Pope's visit last week to the United States of America. When the Antichrist of Rome, the first Jesuit Pope, came to the United States of America to speak in front of a joint session of Congress and also to speak on a United Nations meeting. We will go in future broadcasts on Hour of the Truth and I will go in other videos also more into analyzing that. But enough for now from here. But please go to that Hour of the Truth special, The Global Vatican, and get the book, The Global Vatican. You can get it for a few bucks and read it for yourself. How a Roman Catholic tells you all the history that is left out of your history books when you go to school. Anyway, we are dealing now with the history of Eleanor Darnell, the mother of John Carroll. And uh, I continue reading now in page 174 of the, doc of the book. In 1625, <coughs> sorry, in 1625, at about the, same, uh, about the time young Charles Stuart was inheriting the throne of England from his father, King James I, the one who gave us the King James Bible, the Jesuits converted a high government official to Roman Catholicism. That official was Secretary of State George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore. For the sake of appearances, it was deemed inappropriate for a Catholic to serve a Calvinist monarch, Baltimore resigned his post. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the Jesuits perfected an audacious marriage arrangement between Charles, now King Charles I, and a Roman Catholic princess, Henriette Marie, sister of Louis XIII, or in English, Louis XIII, Louis XIII of France. The marriage purported to be good for Charles's economic interests. He went out of his way to accommodate the Jesuits. Although a Scottish Calvinist, Charles conducted his monarchy in many respects as though it were Roman Catholic. He systematically weakened England's foreign policy toward Catholic France, the country of his queen. He promoted to the highest levels in the Church of England members of the High Church Party, clergymen sympathetic with Roman Catholic ritual and traditions, and he squandered England's resources in a pointless Jesuit-engineered war with Spain. Seven years into his marriage with Henriette Marie, Charles found himself stuck between personal indebtedness to Ignatian creditors and a stingy parliament. In hopes of generating tax revenues abroad, he carved a feudal barony out of northern Virginia and granted it to Lord Baltimore. But Baltimore died before developing the grant. The charter then passed on to his son, Cecilius Calvert. Calvert, the new Lord Baltimore, called persecuted immigrants desiring religious and tax freedom to participate in a voyage to place bearing a name dear to Catholics 
Maryland after the Blessed Virgin. So Maryland, M-A-R-Y, Maryland. Baltimore did not neglect appealing to the religious niche as well. A number of his advertisements spoke of the limitless opportunities from settling in Maryland. Now written M-E-R-R-I-E. -E. Maryland and Maryland. On November 22, 1633, two ships, the Ark and the Dove, set sail from London. The passenger list included three Jesuits, 16 to 20 Roman Catholic gentlemen, several hundred predominantly Protestant slaves and laborers, and Cecilius Calvert's brother Leonard. Leonard Calvert had been appointed Maryland's first governor. The voyage of the Ark and the Dove was spiritually directed by a Jesuit priest named Andrew White. Remember this name. Educated at both St. Omer's, again that Jesuit school in the northern of France, and Douai, where we get the Douai Bible from, a professor for 20 years in Portugal, Spain and Flanders, Andrew White is remembered by the church as, quote-unquote, the Apostle to Maryland. And another little quote I want to tell you here, because we're speaking about the voyage of the two ships, the Ark and the Dove. Get that book, The Ark and the Dove, by J. Moss Ives, and you will see how from there on, and we are talking about 1633, that is 140 plus years before the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the Jesuits planned to make the coming United States a Jesuit enclave. Choosing an Andrew for the task was liturgical cabala on the part of the Jesu. Andrew was the brother of the Apostle Peter, the first Pope, the rock upon whom Roman Catholicism claims to be established. Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland. King Charles I was a Scot. A personal representative of the king's brotherly attitude toward Rome could not be more eloquently identified than by the simple name Andrew. Andrew White consecrated the Maryland voyage to the two Catholic saints, the Virgin Mary, protectress of the Jesuits, and Ignatius Loyola, only recently decreed patron saint of Maryland by Pope Urban VIII, the second pupil of Jesuits to be elected Pope. Well, you see, at that time they had Jesuit pupils to be elected Pope, in 2014, they have a Jesuit of the fourth vow of induction as a Pope. You see the progress they are making? The ships were at sea nearly four months. Finally, 123 days from England, on March 25, 1634, the parties reached St. Clement's Island in the mouth of the Potomac River. It was an auspicious day. Not only was March 25th the first day of spring, but also it was the first day of the Julian calendar. Remember, in 1752 the colonies would adopt the Gregorian calendar, which, now, which we follow now today. But at that time, and that is the Cabela meaning that Tapasorsi writes about, it was a very special day in the Julian calendar. On March 25th, Andrew White read the first Roman Mass ever held in any of the original 13 colonies. Then the formerly took possession of the land, quote, for our Saviour and for our Sovereign Lord King of England, unquote. Maryland historians trace the jurisdictional origins of the Roman Catholic Church in the United States to a patuxent Indian chief Taine's wigwam, which Andrew White denoted in his diary, quote, the first chapel of Maryland, unquote. White introduced Roman Catholicism to the Patuxans, Anacostics, and Piscataways, 
on real estate that today comprises, listen very carefully, the District of Columbia. It's quite probable that the District of Columbia's executive mansion was termed White House, less because of a color of exterior paint than out of reverence for the Apostle to Maryland. Every utterance of White House should fill the historically knowledgeable Jesuit with pride in his society's achievements. What do you think why the White House in Washington is called the White House? Here you get it. Conversations among the Indians ran high, but the society enjoyed greater profits evangelizing Protestants. For every Protestant settler converted, the Jesuits won a land grant from Cecilius Calvert. Other lands Calvert retained and passed on to his descendants. Over the generations, Rock Creek Farm, with its quote-unquote Rome, on which the U.S. Capitol was erected, devolved to the Calvert heiress Eleanor Darnell and her husband, an Irish immigrant whose marriage and abilities had earned enough money to make him a prosperous marchant planter. He was to this, it was to this couple and this land that the first American bishop was born in 1735. Remember, we were always speaking about John Carroll's mother and John Carroll himself, who was called in his younger days Jackie, as we still will learn. Like his older brother Daniel, Jackie Carroll did his earliest schooling at Bohemia Manor, a secret Jesuit academy just down the road. Bohemia Manor had to be run secretly because of anti-Catholic laws resulting from the abdication of Catholic James II and the succession of Protestants William and Mary. Read William, if you don't understand that, William of Orange, the Protestant king at that time in, the United in, uh, in England that they imported more or less from Germany and uh, the Netherlands at that time. William of Orange, who replaced Catholic King James in a, as another Protestant king in Great Britain. So I'm going to read that sentence again. Like his older brother Daniel, <coughs> Jackie Carroll did his earliest schooling at Bohemia Manor, a secret Jesuit academy just down the road. Bohemia Manor had to be run secretly because of anti-Catholic laws resulting from the abdication of Catholic James II and the succession of Protestants William of Orange and Mary to the British throne in 1689. The penal period in Maryland, which would extend up to the American Revolution, served the black papacy well by inclining affluent Catholic families to send their sons across the Atlantic to take the Jesuit Ratio Studiorum at St. Omer's. Indeed, more Americans went to St. Omer's College in the 18th century than to Oxford and Cambridge combined. At the tender age of 13, Jackie sailed to Europe with his even younger cousin, Charles Carroll, for schooling at St. Omer's. Daniel returned home from, here, from there to help manage the family, uh, family's interests he stood to inherit. In 1753, Jackie entered the novitiate of the Jesuits at Wotton in the Netherlands. Charles went on to study pre-law at Voltaire's alma mater, and we read about that earlier in the book, the Collège Louis Grand in Paris. In 1758, Jackie returned to St. Omer's to teach, while Charles crossed the channel to England, enrolling in London's premier school for barristers, the Inner Temple, founded in the 14th century by the Knights Templars. Jackie was ordained to the Jesuit priesthood in 1761. When he learned that St. Omer's was about to be seized by the French government in preparation for the royal edict suppressing the Jesuits in France, 
he with other teachers and their pupils moved to Bruges. In 1769 he renounced his Calvert inheritance, sloughed off his nickname, took the extreme Jesuit vow of papal obedience, and began teaching philosophy and theology at the English College in Liège. It was here that he befriended Charles Philip Storton, his Grand Tour companion. John Carroll's arrival at his mother's home in Maryland coincided with Paul Revere's ride to Philadelphia bearing letters from the Boston Committee of Correspondence seeking aid from Charles Thompson's group in protesting the closing of Boston Harbor. From his mother's estate at Rock Creek, Carroll dealt with the aftermath of the Tea Act by exercising his secularized priestly authority as prefect of the sodality. He integrated the Catholics of Maryland, Pennsylvania and Northern Virginia into the movement for independence. Charles Thompson's Philadelphia Committee sent Boston a letter of support. The committee additionally proposed a congress of deputies from the colonies to a consider measures to restore harmony with Great Britain and b prevent the dispute from advancing to an quote unquote an undesirable end. Thompson then notified all the colonies south of Pennsylvania of his committee's action. He suggested the necessity of calling a general congress to consider the problem. Combined with a similar call from the Virginia House of Burgesses, his suggestion was approved throughout the colonies. Plans were laid for the first Continental Congress to meet at Philadelphia in September. On June 1, 1774, the bill closing Boston Harbor went into effect. Thompson's radicals led Philadelphia in observing a day of mourning. Shops closed, churches held services, the people remained quietly in their homes. On June 8, Thompson and more than 900 freeholders petitioned Governor Richard Penn to convene the Pennsylvania Assembly so that it might consider sending delegates to an all-colony congress to explore ways of restoring harmony and peace to the British Empire. The governor refused their request, which justified Thompson's taking action outside the established order. Thompson called for a town meeting to be held on June 18th. Nearly 8,000 Philadelphians attended. Boisterously, they resolved that the closing of Boston Harbor was tyrannical and that a Continental Congress to secure the rights and liberties of the colonies must be convened in Philadelphia. In July, the Pennsylvania Assembly yielded to Thompson's popular pressure and agreed to name a delegation to, its fir to this first Continental Congress. Thompson, however, was not named. Thanks to the publicity from his quote-unquote first citizen, second citizen media production during the first half of 1773, Charles Carroll was named by the Annapolis Committee of Correspondence to be a delegate to the First Continental Congress. But he declined the nomination. He said that his usefulness might be restricted by anti-Catholic sentiment in, uh, engendered by the Quebec Act, with which Parliament have, had avenged the Boston Tea Party by giving the western lands of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Virginia and New York to Catholic Quebec. He attended the Congress, however, but as an quote-unquote unofficial consultant to the Marylanders. Charles Thompson accompanied the Pennsylvanians in the same capacity. To prepare for the September 5th opening session, delegates began arriving in Philadelphia in late August. They congregated at a well-known radical meeting place, the elegant mansion of Thomas Mifflin. Mifflin had studied classics under Charles Thompson at Benjamin Franklin's Academy, later to become the University of Pennsylvania. They were close friends. As Mifflin's house guest, Thompson was on, hand, was on hand round the clock to greet and confer with the arriving leaders, most of whom already knew him by name. John Adams' diary entry from August 30th speaks of, quote, much conservation conversation, unquote, 
he and his fellows, fellow delegates had with the learned Thompson. He called Thompson, quote, the Sam Adams of Philadelphia and the life of the cause of liberty, unquote. Thompson and the Carrolls, Charles, Daniel and John, spent these critical preliminary days lobbying for the inevit inevitability of war. Thompson was already heavily invested in New Jersey's Batso furnace. Batso would furnish cannonballs, shot, kettles, spikes and nails to the army through the war commissioner, who controlled all the executive duties of the military department. Now, here it comes. The war commissioner was just the man Lorenzo Ricci needed for the job. Take a guess. Charles Carroll. Thompson was elected secretary of the First Continental Congress, an office he held under the title, quote unquote, perpetual secretary, until the United States Constitution was ratified in 1789. He led the delegates through an intimized statement of the American theory of rebellion that culminated in the critical declaration and resolves of October 14th in 1774. It was while the First Continental Congress was deliberating America's future under British tyranny that Ganganelli, Pope Clement XIV, remember, died his agonizing death on September 22nd in 1774. When the papacy is vacant, says New Catholic Encyclopedia, the administration and guardianship of the Holy See's temporal rights, that is, its business affairs, everything that has to do with civility, not with spirituality, are routinely taken over by the treasurer of the Apostolic Chamber. The apostolic treasurer on the day of Ganganella's passing was Cardinal Giovanni Braschi, a 57-year-old aristocrat from impoverished parentage. Cardinal Braschi was a sterling project of the Jesuit colleges. The ratio studiorum had made of him a distinguished lawyer and diplomat. He had been apostolic treasurer when Rothschild began serving the Catholic principality of Hesse Hanover. In 1769. This interesting fact awakens the possibility that the Cardinal and Rothschild had been involved in Ritchie's American project for years. But that's only conjecture. But what's beyond conjecture, however, is that until a new Pope could be elected, the whole fiscal wealth of the Roman Catholic Church belonged to Brasci and to no one else. Although lacking formal entitlement, Cardinal Bresci would rule as a kind of virtual Pontifex Maximus for one of the longest periods of papal vacancy on record. Day after day after day, the conclave haggled over a single issue. What would the candidates do about the Jesuits? Should Ganganelli's brief of this establishment continue to be enforced or not? Although Lorenzo Ricci was in detention at Castel Sant'Angelo, we know he could easily hop a tunnel carriage to the Vatican for covert meetings with the virtual Pope. In a very real way, Brasci was a creation of Ricci's. You know, Brasci studied under Jesuitical Studio Ratiorum. So he was his child, he was his pupil. Brasci had been made a cardinal under the sponsorship of Ganganelli, whose own cardinalate was sponsored, as we recall, by Ricci. These two most powerful men on earth, Ricci and Brasci, had been secretly allied for years. And now the turn of events had made them invisible and inaudible. These last precious days and the final bursting forth of Ritchie's grand strategy afforded ideal conditions for Brasci and Ritchie to determine face to face with the Rothschild emissaries, out of public sight and mind, how the Vatican's immense resources, money, men, supplies, would be deployed in the coming months and years. 
In October 1774, for example, colonial agent Benjamin Franklin sent England's most enlightened copywriter, Tom Paine, to beef up the pamphleteers in Philadelphia. Tom Paine, the author of The Age of Reason, as you remember. The days of papal vacancy wore on. 30, 50, 60, 75, 100 days, 110. Finally, after nearly five months of confusion on February 15, 1775, the 134th day, it was announced that Rome had a new pope. The new pope was a man acceptable to both sides of the Jesuit question. He had tacitly assured the anti-Jesuits that he would continue to enforce this establishment. Yet, the pro-Jesuits knew he would enforce it tenderly because of the great intellectual, political and spiritual debts he owed to the Society of Jesus. The new Pope was best qualified for the papacy because he'd been running the Holy See with Lorenzo Ricci for the past 134 days. Giovanni Brasci. And Brasci took the papal name of Pius VI and now plummeted the great avalanche. On February 9, 1775, the British Parliament declared Massachusetts to be, quote unquote, in a state of rebellion. On March 23rd, Patrick Henry delivered his famous Give me liberty or give me death oration. On April 19th, at a tense daybreak confrontation on Lexington Green between a group of angry colonists and some 800 redcoats, an unseen and unidentified shootist fired on the redcoats from behind a nearby meeting house. This was the quote-unquote shot heard around the world. Although Ralph Waldo Emerson coined that phrase in his Concord Hymn in 1836 to describe a skirmish at Concord Bridge, seven miles away and a few hours later. The air on Lexington Green crackled with exploding gunpowder, and when the smoke cleared, eight colonists lay dead. As the Redcoats, <coughs> as the Redcoats returned to Boston, they were attacked by ever-increasing colonial militiamen. The Massachusetts Provincial Congress mobilized 13,600 colonial soldiers and placed Boston under a siege that lasted for almost a year. To prevent the spread of the Boston carnage to the Quaker province, the Pennsylvania Assembly named Charles Thompson and 12 others to a committee to purchase explosive and munitions, the leading manufacturers of which happened to be Thompson and Charles Carroll. On May 10th, the Second Continental Congress convened in Philadelphia and named George Washington Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. On June 22nd, Congress voted to issue a continental currency, two million dollars in unsecured bills of credit to be used in paying the costs of war. Two million dollars in unsecured bills of credit. What do we have today with the so-called Federal Reserve notes? Started easy, didn't it? On July the 3rd, George Washington formally assumed command of the Continental Army. About 17,000 men gathered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. On July 5th, Congress adopted its last humble plea for peace with England, the quote-unquote Olive Branch Petition, written by Charles Thompson and John Dickinson. Governor Penn of Pennsylvania personally delivered the petition to London, but the King's friends prevented George III from seeing Penn or even acknowledging the petition. On July 6th, Congress adopted the Declaration of the Causes and Necessities of Taking Up Arms, which fell short of asserting independence, but vowed a holy war of liberation from slavery. 
on august twenty third george the third issued a proclamation declaring that all thirteen american colonies were in state of open rebellion two months later in october british forces burned falmouth what is presently portland in maine the war was on but from lorenzo from lorenzo ritchie's vantage point the war was won there remained only opportunities now for his enemies, the British Crown and the American Colonials, to engage in bloodletting hostilities that would eventually separate and exhaust them both. Divide et empera. Divide and conquer. What to the British was, quote unquote, the war of American rebellion, and to the Americans, quote unquote, the war for independence, was to General Ritchie, quote, the war of reunification with Protestant dissidents, unquote. From it would rise the first Febronian government on earth, a constellation of secular churches called states, led by an electorate of laymen properly enlightened by the Ratio Studiorum and united under the spiritual guidance of Pontifex Maximus, and paying tribute to Rome for the privilege. United States. The real war over. There began now the unraveling, which was the historical war, the theatrical, the theatrical war. This would consist of a series of bloody battles mounted by Congress and Crown for the people's participation, observation and commemoration. These events would produce Caesarian Rome's essential emotional cornerstone. Like Virgil's Aeneid, epic national heroes would forge a fictitious national legacy. We must not forget Charles Thompson's candid assessment that the revolution's leaders were largely deceptions, men of quote unquote, supposed wisdom and valor, who were far inferior to quote, the qualities that have been ascribed to them. Unquote. And there is evidence, admittedly the faintest hint of evidence, as is so often the case with clandestine warriors, that Lorenzo Ricci communed with these American heroes and gave them instruction on their own soil. This evidence is presented in our next chapter. And this ends the reading of chapter 18 of Rulers of Evil, The Stimulating Effects of Tea. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I am very much looking forward to the next chapter. This book gets better by the page. Incredible. So, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching the video. And see you next time. Until then, God bless you and bye-bye.